Man, this is one of my favorite songs ever. Shifting into second gear, this 1979 follow-up record was a welcome hybrid of classic rock and new wave, setting today's band on cruise control straight into the heart of the 80s. And although they had two lead singers behind the wheel, that never slowed them down. One was a quirky, cool genius, and the other a, a mysterious and shadowy heartthrob. It was almost like they were moving in stereo. In fact, some people had a pretty hard time telling their voices apart. Could you? I could, but uh, out of the garage, into the mainstream, it's the story of a band and a song that paved the way for a new decade of synth rock. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever been called the king or the queen of useless information, you're gonna dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and click the, the bell so you never miss out. Also, check us out on Patreon for even more behind the scenes footage and uncut interviews that helps us keep it a daily channel. So sometime between the summers of 1978 and 1979, Carr's co-lead singer and bassist, Benjamin Orr, who's sitting in his new top floor Boston apartment, going out of his mind. From somewhere below him, there was this incessant booming of disco beats coming up through the floorboards, pounding over and over again. That day, Orr vowed never to succumb to playing trendy music just to please the masses. Said Benjamin Orr, it was the same exact beat for 45 straight minutes. Could have been 15 different songs for all I know. I guess they get machines to play it. I'd saw my fingers off before I'd play that stuff. End of quote. Now, thankfully, Benjamin's fingers stayed intact. The previous summer on June 6th of 1978, the Cars gave music lovers just what they needed when they released their self-titled debut. The new wave meets classic rock start to finish masterpiece. It was a welcome reprieve from the Saturday Night Feverish hits dominating the charts at that moment. One of the best debuts of the rock and roll era out of any genre. The Cars introductory record featured superb artistry from a crew of experienced musicians led by the band's well-known co-lead singer and rhythm guitarist, Rick Okasik. The rest of the band was rounded out by Elliot Easton on lead guitar, Greg Hawks on keyboards, David Robinson on drums, and of course, the aforementioned Benjamin Orr on bass. Different from the guitar-oriented bands, rock bands of the late 70s, the Cars meshed so many different styles into their sound. It really made their music totally stand out from everything else on the radio. She's my best friend's girl. Using synthesizers to blend with their art rock and rockabilly influences, the Cars were one of the first true power pop rock bands. And they were the leaders in ushering in the new wave synth era of the 80s. I mean, that first album, it was amazing. It was a massive success. Parked on the, the Billboard 200 for 139 consecutive weeks. Since then, it's kicked it into even higher gear, securing platinum times six status in the U.S. As for Benjamin Orr, I got to tell you, I've said it before, he's one of my favorite vocalists of all time. His vocals are just so expressive in a way that feels effortless, so nonchalant. Plus, he has this incredible versatility. He could stand up and deliver driving rockers, just, just what I needed. Could sing straight into your soul with ballads like Drive. Drive Music and media entrepreneur Bill Wilkins, who worked with the band during their early years, witnessed a dramatic change that came over Ben. Uh, after the cars hit the big time. He said that back before they were signed, Benjamin was just this happy-go-lucky kid. He liked to party, he laughed a lot, he pulled practical jokes. But by the time Candy O came out, Orr had a completely different vibe. Increasingly withdrawn, uh, Bill wondered if the frenzied ride of immediate success and the burdens of fame had caused him to retreat emotionally. Stephen Bickford, a show designer who worked closely with the cars on their concerts, he also offered up some insight into Benjamin Orr uh, in his biography. He said that Ben was always smiling, 
but he stayed to himself a lot. Frontman had a mysterious smile that made people think he had some sweet secret going on. He also had this ultra casual way of handling himself, whether he was walking into a room, getting up out of a chair, or passing through a doorway. It was all just so carefree. And yet Orr was always completely aware of who he was, where he was, and who else was around him. It was calculated casual. Bickford would go on to say that, you know, Ben did keep to himself a lot. Yeah, he could be very sociable, cordial, and engaging. But in his opinion, Bickford's opinion, it was all just a disguise. The real Benjamin was reserved for a select few who knew him best. His private, most inner self was always his to share at his own discretion. This mysterious dynamic that kept Orr so aloof and, and so enticing was further intensified by his partnership with Okasik. The two shared vocal responsibilities, uh, giving the cars a striking onstage dynamic. And though Rick wrote the bulk of the lyrics, he didn't hesitate to de defer to Orr's vocal interpretation if the song called for it. When one interviewer mentioned to Rick that after a year of listening to the cars, he still couldn't differentiate his vocals from Benjamin Orr's, the frontman attributed the similarities to the years performing together. Uh, first as a folk rock duo, and then in a series of rock bands. The two were just so in tune with each other that they couldn't help but sound a lot alike. However, Rick would also add to this statement, saying of Ben, his voice is much more trained than mine. He could probably sing a Paul McCartney song and handle it very well, whereas I could, I would have to stylize it. There's some edge between us, but you don't quite know where it is. Even though some people have a hard time telling the difference between Orr and Okasik's vocals, for me, I, I don't know, it just wasn't really a problem. I could always pick out Rick's voice. It was just a little quirkier than Orr's, and it gave the cars more of a, a new wave vibe when he was singing. But you kept it going till the sun fell down. You kept it. But no matter who was singing, it was like listening to this spectacular, otherworldly force, this band. She's my one desire. They're just incredible. Now, as we continue to break this record down, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I wear every single day. Right now, you can get prescription glasses, prescription sunglasses. Uh, Zenny's Affordable Sunnies is what they call them. They protect your eyes and your wallet all year long. Check it out today at zenny.com. Uh, also, make sure to add uh, great features like blue blocks that protect your eyes from digital blue light. Let's go. Going back to the cars, at the time, I don't think anyone could have predicted that this obscure Boston band would break AM radio's resistance to new wave rock. I mean, yeah, other waivers were up and coming. Oh, if it's right, rock is she really going but the cars, they were at the forefront. Said drummer David Robinson, I'd like to think we had something to do with things changing. Just the fact that people are buying our record, it amazes me. I thought it was a little too eccentric to be as popular as it was. I mean, the cars carried their first album momentum into the making of that sophomore album. Most of Candy O was written by Rick on the road, which eliminated pressure to come up with new material in the studio. After rehearsing together at Bill Reisman's Northern Studios, just outside of Boston, the band traveled to Cherokee Studios in LA, and there they reunited with producer Roy Thomas Baker. The entire 11-track album took less than a month to create and just 14 days to record. It'd be a lot different when they were working with Mutt Lang a little bit later. However, fearing a candy O would slow sales of the band's hot-selling debut, Elektra wanted to hold it back. But the guys said, no way. They were going to hold that back, said Okasik. Uh, they were going to hold us back, and we can't just sit around and be held back. End of quote. Candy O, it was released on June 13th, summer of 1979, a year and a week after their first record. It was a collection of tight synth rock songs, concise lyrics, and eccentric pop quirk. Highlights, of course, included the three singles, It's All I Can Do, Double Life, and Today's Song. Let's go. One of my favorites ever. It's all I can do. Let's go. 
Before we get into that, the good times keep rolling on after that in this album. There's so much more uh, from the debut album, Holdover Night Spots, to the eponymous Candy O, and the big finish, Dangerous Type. Great songs. Really, if you love the Cars, you're just going to love this record. It's one of my favorites by them, if not their favorite uh, studio album. Candy O actually charted higher than the Cars debut release, ascending to number three on the Billboard 200 album chart and went platinum in less than two months. In the US, it was certified platinum four times over in 2001. And just like his predecessor, Candy O stuck around for an extended chart stay, hung out for over a year. The Cars really do live up to their name. So much of their music, it's a blast, and it makes for a perfect uh, driving soundtrack. That's a concept not lost on Okasik, who said as much to Trouser Press back in 79. He said, it's fun, it is car music. One of the best places to listen to music is in a car. You're in your own world when you're driving around listening to the radio. And uh, Let's Go certainly drives with the best of them. I mean, it is unfair how perfect this song is. From the second it starts, and you hear that distinct wah-wah you know, keyboard. There's no doubt it's gonna be a great day from here on out whenever you hear that song. I, can, I, I just can't tell you how many times I've almost run myself off the road when the song comes on. I mean, when you get to that end chorus, you just gotta start clapping along. Let's go. I mean, it's just, by the way, that clapping of Let's Go, that was inspired by the Router's 1962 song, Let's Go Pony. As usual, Okasik's lyrics are unusual in the best way possible, mixing 60s pop simplicity, provocative curveballs, and clever turns of phrase. Rick's lyrics are always memorable, even if they don't completely make sense the first time you hear them. And let's go fit squarely into that pattern. She's winding them down on her clock machine. She's a frozen fire. She's my one desire. She's so beautiful now and she doesn't wear her shoes. It's jukebox poetry, man. I don't think too hard about the lyrics. I mean, it's the emotion behind the music and the mesmerizing tone of the voice, but it's such a joy when the unexpected images from Okasik dance around in your head. What I do make of the song is that the writer of the song, Rick, his protagonist is pining after a beautiful, free-spirited 17-year-old girl who no doubt likes the nightlife baby. I like the nightlife baby. This protagonist just wants to be part of her world. He says, I don't want to hold her down, don't want to break her crown. When she says, let's go. let's go. Now, as the song progresses, both us as listeners and this would-be suitor realize that there's no slowing this girl down. But for him, there's a problem. This girl's so revved up that she never likes to choose, meaning she's looking for a good time, not a boyfriend. When Orr sings she's laughing inside because they can't refuse, inside, they can't refuse, she knows that she has him and all the rest of the guys wrapped around her finger. And when I asked her before, she said she's holding out. I mean, it may not be a happy ending for this not-so-secret admirer, but at least he's along for the ride, and if the ride is half as great as this song, it's going to be well worth it. Uh, Let's Go has one of my favorite moments in a classic rock song ever. I mean, it's absolute sonic uppercut that knocks me senseless every time. So you know that end chorus when Benjamin Moore just wells, I like the nightlife baby.
It's perfection. It's another obvious illustration of why the cars were so far ahead of the field. They have this incredible attention to detail and an ability to just elevate you to an entirely different headspace. I mean, let's go with such a tight synth-driven rocker and the epitome of what the car's catalog has to offer. I mean, and so much of the credit has to go to Benjamin Orr on this one. I mean, his mystique, his casual cool, it just puts let's go over the top. I remember back when I, I was a sophomore in high school, I was in one of the worst funks of my teenage years. The girl I was in love with, she started dating one of my good friends. She had a crush on him. My car was totaled in a car wreck. And I found out I had a D on my midterm report card, you know, leading up to parent-teacher conference. I mean, my dad was gonna kill me and I was, I was gonna be grounded for a long time. I remember I was sitting in the back of my friend's car and I was sulking, you know, in the worst mood of my, my young life. I wouldn't speak. No matter what any of my friends would do, I wouldn't show any bit of emotion. I was just giving everybody the silent treatment. I was almost catatonic. I was sinking into the depths of depression. We all think it's the end of the world when we're teenagers. The offer to be my favorite food. They tried to crack jokes. They tried anything and everything, and I was just unreachable. And then I saw my friend Chris's face light up, and he said, I know it'll break this spell. He pulled out a cassette and he crammed it into the tape deck in the car. And all of a sudden I heard that familiar sound. <music> Benjamin Orr and company singing Let's Go. And by the time they got to that first chorus, my hands uncontrollably started to clap that awesome beat. And I was screaming, let's go. And I like the nightlife baby to the top of my lungs. Just like that, it was out of my funk. I was singing every word. Very few songs can transform you like that. This song deserved to be a number one hit. I don't know how it wasn't. It was released as Candio's first single in June of 79. It reached number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100 uh, and the US Cashbox chart. And in the UK, it went to number 51. In New Zealand, it reached number 40. Elsewhere, it broke the top 10, going to number six in Australia and number five in Canada. Let's Go has appeared in multiple movies and TV shows, including Chasing Amy in 97, not another teen movie in 2001, Nearing Grace in 2005, and uh, Bumblebee in 2018. Let's Go has also been covered by the Purple One himself, Prince. as well as Ween, uh, Corey Taylor. And Lit. By the end of the Candio tour, the cars were fully realizing stardom and their popularity would only keep rising throughout their career. These guys put together an incredible run of platinum selling records from their debut to Candy O, Panorama, Shake It Up, Heartbeat City, and their 1985 Greatest Hits release. One of the greatest, greatest hits releases ever. Everybody has this Greatest Hits album. Everybody, seriously. They've sold roughly 25 million albums in the US. In all, the cars released five top 10 albums in the US and their Greatest Hits record just missed out at reach number 12. During their time, they also turned in 13 top 40 hits on the Hot 100, including Shake It Up at number four. Shake it up. Shake it up. On the US rock charts, they had two number one hits, You Might Think and Magic, both from that epic Mutt Lang produced Heartbeat City. The Cars went on hiatus following the release of 1987's Less Than Expected Door-to-Door -door album. Uh, they spent decades apart. Tragically, we lost Benjamin Orr in the process, also enduring the brief stint of the new Cars before reuniting. 
2011's Move Like This was a welcome reminder of the band's past glories. And now, of course, we've lost Rick Ocasek, too. The two band brothers are sorely missed as the instigators of the greatest classic rock new wave group in music history. No question. One of the only bands that have run the gauntlet, attracting fans from every genre, every walk of life. Let's go indeed. Let's go. Leave us a comment about the Cars and Let's Go. Who is your favorite Cars vocalist? What are your favorite songs? Is it too hard to choose? Do you know the difference between the two? Have you gotten mixed up over time? Let's have a good discussion. Tell me your memories of Let's Go. Uh, also check out our other Cars features. Uh, just Benjamin Orr, what a voice. Uh, take a second, if you will, and subscribe. We'd love to have you. Support us on Patreon if you're willing. It all is about keeping the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.